I love that song. I love that idea, just the simplicity of God, God loving us. Uh, John 3, 6, everybody knows it. For God was so angry at sin that he sent his only son. That's not what it says, but I reckon that's how some people live. That God was so focused on sin that God looked down from heaven and said, sin is really what I'm focused on here and I'm so mad about it that I've got to do something. It doesn't say that. It says that God was looking at people who were impacted by sin and the results of sin and that God's heart was so for them because when he looked upon them, he sees his own fingerprints. He sees his own handiwork when he looks at you. Uh, how many of us, that? how many people have children here? There's a few of us. <laughs> By the way, I love during uh, when we were having that time of worship there. You guys probably didn't see it. I was up the back, but some of the kids there with their hands lifted to the Lord and, and uh, even the singing in tongues over there, that was fantastic. Uh, awesome. I loved it. It's great to see the kids worshipping God. But, um, but it says that God so loved. God so loved the world. When, when we had out, we got four kids, uh, my daughter, Chloe, up the back. Um, our three boys aren't here this morning. Uh, they're all older, um, over age kids. But um, how many of you, when you had children, your dream and your goal when those kids were born, you were dreaming of a future where they would be estranged from you? None of us. Is that right? You're laughing and chuckling away because you're thinking, you're an idiot, Al. That's stupid. Why even say it? But I often think, you know, that was never the heart of God either when God created humanity, that we would start off so innocent and pure, but as we got older, we would begin to adopt mentalities and thought processes and lifestyles that would estrange us from the most loving father we could ever know. It's not the will and plan of God. So thank you, God, that you so loved us. God's motivation for the cross was not anger, it's sin. It was love for you and love for me is imperfect as you are. How many people here feel like you're good enough for God? Who this week's dotted every I and crossed every T? You've nailed it. Like, I mean, you've just nailed your walk with the Lord this week. You've absolutely nailed it. Come on, someone's got to have nailed it, surely. Anyway, Theo, you're, you're pretty holy, dude. You must have known. Oh, sorry, Don was laughing. You didn't. You made mis- <laughs> Theo made mistakes this week, everybody. Did something wrong. Did something wrong. <laughs> Jackie, you must have nailed it this week. I mean, I, I work overtime to make your life so easy and stress-free. <laughs> any, any, if you do sin, it's all on you. There's no excuses. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, every single one of us. We all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, but he loves us anyway, and it's a pretty amazing thought. Uh, amen? Okay. Look, I just want to <coughs> share some thoughts uh, with us this morning in the little bit of time that we've got um, left. We've been, been talking the last uh, three, four weeks, or we're going to finish this week. We've been looking at a topic of characteristics of radical responders, and we've been drawing from uh, the story in Mark 11 where Jesus is heading into Jerusalem, and he sends... <laughs> to unknown, unnamed disciples to go and steal someone's donkey. That's basically what he says. Go and steal this dude's donkey. And he's honest with him. Steal the donkey. You're going to get busted. When you're busted, just say Jesus wants it. And they go, eh, okay. And that's what happened, what <laughs> Jesus said happened. So we've been looking at the characteristics of radical responders because that is a radical response to a radical request from a radical God. And I'm convinced that God still has radical requests And as we live in a society that's getting further and further away from God, uh, less and less inclined to want to listen to anything that the writers of this collection of ancient documents have told us about who God is and how he thinks, the further away from that society gets, the more radical someone that actually stands up for God appears to be. Um, So I think there's a plethora, I like that word, I'm going to throw it in there, plethora, of radical responses still to be made for the kingdom of God, the question is not is God still asking for radical responses. The real question is do we still have radical responders in the church anymore? Um, One of the the things with coronavirus that's been floating around, I said the C word, sorry. But one of the things with that is that everywhere we go, what are we doing? We're washing our hands and we're sanitising ourselves and we're trying to make ourselves completely pure and germ-free and create a society where nobody catches this particular thing. And I think it's great. I'm all for washing my hands and sanitation and all that sort of stuff. But I guess the downside of, of that is you can get over-sanitised to the point where your body's immune system could actually end up weakening. And there's this natural immune system that builds up that helps fight off certain things. And we could end up uh, overly immuning ourselves to the point where uh, our defensive system, what's inside of us, has very little impact on other things that might want to 
come at us. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm certainly not a health practitioner, uh, but I'm just saying that's the way my brain thinks. I wonder whether we could go there. But it makes me think about the church. Have we over-sanitized the church by trying to fit into our culture, by trying to be relevant to the world around us, by trying to make excuses for some of the radical claims that Jesus made, for trying to make excuses and find ways around some of the radical lifestyles that we're called to, to the point where we've really sanitised the church, sanitised the message, and now we're realising we have very little impact anymore in the world. We're just a bunch of people over there in the corner doing our thing while the world marches forward. I just do not believe that was ever God's original intention for the church, for his body. In the beginning when God created uh, people, it says in Genesis that he said to them, be fruitful, have dominion, look after the earth, do the right thing, but I want you guys to be in charge. I want you guys to lead the, lead the way in terms of what's happening down here. As time has gone on, you don't have to be uh, a very intelligent human being to realise we've lost the plot somewhere and we're no longer leading the way that we were called to and meant to. We were no longer leading the way God originally envisioned and intended that his people would be in society and in the world. We've kind of allowed ourselves to slowly take a back seat. And I wonder, I just wonder, I'm hypothesising, another big word. Uh, I, I like to bring big words in because it... It lifts my wife's opinion of my me, me when I chuck in a lot of big words. She just baffles her, and afterwards we'll talk about how great that word was. Um, but oh, now I'm all discombobulated from going off track. But I think there's a lot more. There's a lot more potency and influence that the body of Christ is meant to have in society. Uh, once upon a time, we did. We led the world. We were coming up with all the cool inventions and the cool ideas. We were coming up with all the best music and arts, and we were leading the way in medicine. And we were, and somewhere along the way, we've taken a bit of a back seat. So we've been looking at characteristics of radical responders. And what I'm really wanting to do is, my prayer is this: God, would you stoke each of us with a big kettle prod to start thinking a little more radically about? I mean, let's face it: if we who believes, who believes that, that the God, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal flesh? I mean, Paul wrote that. Who believes that? Who actually thinks that that's true? That the spirit that raised, so in other words, 2,000 years ago, there's this dark tomb and it's dark because there was no lights and electricity there. So that the thing across and it's all dark and there's this dead body and it's wrapped up and it's just laying there motionless on the thing. And nobody knows what happened because nobody was in there to record it. But I'm going to, again, hypothesize that the Holy Spirit just drifted into the tomb and just walked up to the body of Jesus. And maybe with the Holy Spirit's index finger, if he has one, he touched the big toe of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, poof, this power flowed from the big toe of Jesus right through his ankles and his knees and up to his hips. And who needs the power of Jesus in their knees and hips today? I know I do, up through the knees and the hips and up through the body and then all of a sudden this body that was physically dead was brought back to life. Who thinks that's pretty impressive? I think that's a pretty impressive feat. Now, Paul reckons that that same spirit that 2,000 years ago was in that tomb, that touched the lifeless body of Jesus Christ, Paul, he's convinced. And I think the Holy Spirit wants you to be convinced too. That's why he allowed that particular writing, that message to be recorded in this and 2,000 years later for us to still have it. He wants us to know and believe that that spirit lives in you right now. Put your hand on your chest and say, that spirit lives in me. That spirit, <laughs> that spirit lives in you, that Holy Spirit of God. In the beginning of Genesis, when God said, let there be, and it says right at the start that the Spirit of God was hovering above, that Spirit is here right now living in you. Guess what? He's not only here right now living in you. When you get out of bed tomorrow morning and you go to work, he's going to be in you then. How amazing is that? You might have a person at the desk next to you that's natty, 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 going on, going on, wanting to steal your joy, steal your peace. You might have people backbiting you in the office. You might have people clawing for your job, spitting out lies so that they can climb above you, make you look bad. You might go to school tomorrow and you might have kids at school that don't think twice about you. You're not the most sporty, so you're not out there kicking the footies. We don't think you're the coolest because your hair's parted on the left, should be on the right, whatever. Kids can be cruel these days. But you know what? Here's the thing. No matter what's going on there, that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if this is true, if it's true, 
if it's true, that spirit is in you in that moment. It's with you. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. Think about that. We spend so much time thinking about everything else, don't we? We spend so much time thinking about the problems and the issues and what's not going our way and what's not for us and so on. I'll tell you what, if this is true, if this is true, there's a lot of stuff that's going good for you. Amen? A lot of stuff in your favour today. A lot of stuff in your, uh, on your side. So we've been looking at these characteristics of radical responders, and I think it's time that we got a certain radicalness back to the church. You know, we're not just meant to be known in society as the morally nice people. You know? We're just the morally nice people. You're, Bevan, you are. You're just such a morally nice guy, and you really are, and I mean that. You're such a nice guy. But you know what? Inside of Bevan is the power that can raise the dead as well. So I better... Inside of Bevan is this fire of the Holy Spirit. Inside of Bevan is a God that could snap his fingers and change the world in an instant. That spirit dwells inside of this human vessel called Bevan. That's amazing. Inside of me and inside of you. So I think God wants some radical responders. We've been talking about characteristics of radical responders. I want to finish up today with the last characteristic of radical responders. And what I want to do is show you what a radical, show you someone in the Bible who I think was not a radical responder in order to bring out the point of radical responders. If you've got a Bible there, turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 18. I'll put my glasses on to make sure I got that right. Could be Ezekiel for all I know. No, Luke 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 18 to 23. It says this, Now a certain ruler asked him, this is a, 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 a smart dude came to Jesus and he's trying to get around something that I want to talk about in a second. It's very hard to get around if you really want to have all that God has for you and be all God wants you to be. Now a certain ruler asked him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. He said, do you know the commandments? Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness on your father and your mother. He said, all these things I've kept from my youth, I'm going to call him a liar. Amen? I don't believe that he kept every single one of them, but it's okay. Reality is in the eye of the beholder. He thinks that he does. And so he says to Jesus, I've done all of this. And Jesus doesn't call him out on it. I love Jesus for that. doesn't call me out on everything. doesn't call you out on everything. And so Jesus says this to him. He says, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sorrowful because he was very, very rich. Here's a picture of an unradical responder. The two guys that went to get the donkey were radical responders. This guy here is a great picture of a totally unradical responder. The three characteristics that we've talked about so far. First one is a radical responder's are followers, not just believers. Well, here's a guy that starts by saying, good teacher. Jesus knew what he was saying. When Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and that's God. In other words, you've acknowledged something about me. You can see something about me. So here's a guy that's believing something about Jesus. But as we go on in the story, guess what? He chooses not to follow. So he's a believer, but he's not going to follow. The first characteristic was that they, they follow. They're not just believers. The second characteristic that we talked about was that they move forward by faith, not held back by feelings. Here's Jesus offering this guy a type of life. But he says the way you're going to get there is for you in particular. And he doesn't say this to everybody, but he said to him, sell everything, give it to the poor, come follow me. And what does he do? He became very sorrowful. So instead of moving forward in faith based on what God said to him, he allowed how he felt to hold him back from what God had for him. And how often have we done that? We get excited about something, excited about a sermon, excited about a message. God tells us something, we read something. But when we sit back and we think about how we feel about obedience, how often do we just not obey? If we just stepped forward in faith and just did what God was saying, how different could the outcomes be? Uh, we'll never know. If we continue to look at it and instead of obeying, first thing we do is we ask ourselves the question, how do I feel about that? Because most of the time we don't feel great about stepping out in faith. It's scary. It's frightening. There's an element of risk about that stuff. So this guy doesn't go forward by faith. He's held back because he became very sorrowful. Third characteristic was that radical responders are inspired by God's word, but we're not limited by God's word. 
He's a guy that had the Ten Commandments. He said, Jesus, bang, 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 all this stuff. And then Jesus tells him something. Now, here's the thing. What Jesus told him to do was not necessarily found in the Bible, but the spirit and the context of what he was talking about is definitely found in the Bible. Not everything in your life is going to be found in the Bible. I never found a Bible verse that said, Alan should marry Jackie. It's not there. If you can find it, let me know. So I had to depend on the voice of God and God speaking to me in some other way to know that, hey, is this going to work, God? Is this going to be a good thing? What job are you going to take? It doesn't say in there you should take a job at Richmond Christian College. You've got to, but you're going to sit with God. You're going to think about it. You're going to balance it up with the character nature of God. Does it fit in with the direction God's got for me? Does it fit in with all the other stuff? Is it, with, is it outside the boundaries of the character of God? Of course it's not. So you make decisions that way. So we're inspired by the word of God, but we're not limited. And the last one that I want to talk about very briefly today, and I'm only going to talk about it very briefly because I don't want you to hate me. How many of you know there are many things in the Bible that I wish Jesus never said them? Anyone ever come across a passage and you get, <laughs> it would have been so much easier if you didn't say that. Anyone, am I the only person here? There's so many things in this book that I just wish Jesus never said. In fact, I said to my wife the other day, and I'm going to do it, I'm going to do a series here and I'm going to call it, I wish you never said that. And you will probably not come for that whole time because you're going to wish I never preached on it, but I want to talk about all the things that Jesus said that I wish he never said because there's a lot of things in there I wish he never said. And if I was this rich young ruler, I bet you what Jesus just said to me was one of the things I wish he never said. Go and sell everything, give it to the poor, come follow me. Jesus, I wish you never said that. But he said it to this particular guy, and I'm not saying that that's what Jesus says to everybody. That's what Jesus said to him. And here's the fourth characteristic of radical responders. They sacrifice for the mission of God. They don't sacrifice the mission of God. Let me say it again. They sacrifice for the mission of God. They don't sacrifice the mission of God. Let me give you an unfortunate truth. 2 Corinthians 5 says that when you came to faith, you became a new creation. Everyone aware of that passage? If any... Man be in Christ. He's a new creation. That new creation was given a new cause. You aware of that? He goes on in 2 Corinthians 5 and he begins to talk about how God has given each of us a ministry. So people wonder, what's my ministry? Well, 2 Corinthians 5 will tell you. That ministry is this. You've been given a ministry of reconciliation. And then Paul explains that and expands on it going, if you don't know what that is, this is what that ministry of reconciliation is it's as if God is pleading through your life to mankind be reconciled to God. Come back to God. There's a God who loves you and you should get reconnected with him because he's got good things in store for you. He's, he's, he's not a religion. He's not trying to bog you down. He doesn't want to steal uh, thing. He wants to give. The, the things that God wants to give to you, you're not going to find any other way. You can turn to drugs if you want, but you're not going to find the kind of high that God gives to you. You can, you, can, you can isolate yourself from people and think you'll have no troubles. You won't find the peace that God wants to give to you. You can run to substances. You can run to fame and fortune. You can become the most wealthy person in the world. You can become the greatest movie star, greatest TV star. You can go in any direction that you want to find what you're searching for. Whatever that end game is, I'll guarantee you this, it won't be better than what Jesus can give you. And that's the message that we have for the world. It's a message that God wants you to come back to him. It's nice and simple. And whether we like it or not, every single one of us have been given a role to play in our community, our society, our nations, our world, that these people would come back to God. It's not just the role or call of an evangelist. It's every single one of us. If you're a new creation in this room, then you've been given a new cause. Everybody wants to chase after a cause these days. Have you noticed that? that there are just causes galore floating around the world. And there's a new cause pops up every day and people are running off chasing this cause and chasing that cause and chasing that cause and so on. I've got a, a friend of mine and I bumped into him downtown uh, a few uh, week, weeks ago and, and this is a guy that when I came to faith, I came to faith at 19 years of age and I didn't know nothing about nothing and I found myself in this organisation where these young people are, Youth with a Mission, and there was a man there um, and this particular guy was uh, leading the YWAM base at the time, and he's a radical evangelist. He just 
He, I've been with him in the, in the streets of the Gold Coast where back when you used to be able to just stand up on a park bench and just start preaching freely. I've watched him get smacked in the mouth and then 10 minutes later sitting there praying for the guy that jobbed him, you know. Uh, he just had a passion for the cause of Christ. He understood that he was a new creation. He understood that part of that call upon his life was to, to, to communicate this message to the world. Hey, there's a good, good father out there. There's a good God. You need to be reconciled to him. You know what? Your life, and I use this illustration a lot for a second. Everyone just have a look at the crack in the concrete wall there. I just want you to just have a look at that. See this? I want you to imagine this is eternity. It starts over here and ends there. Silly, silly picture because eternity doesn't end. But let's imagine that it did. Your life is that. That's your life. I don't mean to downplay you or make you feel insignificant. I just want to give you a perspective. That's your life. And history is called history for a reason because it's his story. And from the very beginning, when God created man, he had a history. A timeline. There was a time where man was created. There's a time where Jesus died. There's going to be a time when Jesus comes back. Who believes that? And when Jesus comes back, those of us that are born again have already passed from death to life. So that's why when you read the New Testament, there's not a lot of talk about death. You notice that? They don't talk a lot about death in there because we're not going to die. I'm just going to shed this tent of mine and move into a better model. Can't wait for that to happen, especially around here. It's expanding quite a bit. It was never the plan, but it's happening. So one day we're going to be gone. And that little crack in the wall there, for whatever reason, God determined that I'd be born at this particular time in human history right now, right here. I'm meant to be alive during coronavirus. Isn't that great? I'm not going to get down about it. I'm looking at it going, okay, well, God, well, I was meant to be here when coronavirus hit planet. I was meant to be here. It was part of your ordained plan, God. So where are the opportunities? What can we do? We can sit around and mope about it or we can go, no, 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 we're here for such a time as this. The church can rise up and go, you know what, we've got a part to play in society right now or we can go, oh, well, let's all get locked down and be quiet now and stop talking about Jesus and we want this and we want that. It's, 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 it depends on, on how we see it. But the point I make is this. I was given a thin opportunity in the course of human history to spend time down here and I call it my life. And with that tiny, tiny little piece of Dot that I have in the timeline of eternity, what am I going to do with that? What's going to be the major focus of that? What's the most important thing for me during that time? And I think what God wants from his people is that the most important thing during that time for us would be the thing that is most important during that time for him. And that is that everybody in my time would come to faith. I think it's... um, don't quote me to Peter 3 9. It's the will of God that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Anyone ever read that? It's the will of God that no one should perish. It's the will of God that every person on planet Earth in my time would come to repentance and faith in Jesus. And it's the will of God that I would be the instrument through which He takes that message to the world whether it be through what I say, whether it be through living out kingdom values, even in an environment where kingdom values are not popular, taking a stand for Jesus, even in a moment where taking a stand for Jesus might actually cost me. I might actually have to pay a price for my faith. See, this guy that uh, in YWAM, I bumped into him downtown the other day, and I hadn't seen him for a long, long time. But we did what we shouldn't have done because we hadn't seen something for so long. We had a big hug in the middle of the main street down here and then realised, oh, can't touch each other. It's not. But, it, you know, it's like worship. How many of you struggle not to sing in worship? There's just certain things that are innate in us. Uh, since I came to faith, there are certain things that are part of my world and it's so hard to suppress those. But we're doing the best we can. But I'll tell you what, during worship, it's so hard not to lift my voice to a God that when I was 19 in the gutter saved me. I, I find it hard not to be able to do that. But we, we, we do the right thing. So I bumped into him and I had a chat with him. You know what he's doing? He, 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 he had a bad experience in life. Things didn't go exactly how he wanted them to go. And so ever since that moment, he's gone chasing after another cause. And he's down the town there and he's, he's distributing flyers and getting in people's faces about uh, should you get vaccinated and shouldn't and all this stuff. Look, I, I keep that debate out of here. I'm not interested in that. You make your opinion. I make my opinion. But he's ramming down my throat that the World Health Organization is doing this and they're doing that. And, look, maybe you're right. That could be right. But you know what? 
I've got a pinprick of time here on planet Earth and I've got one cause that I'm going to put my life to and one cause that I'm about. And that cause is about making sure that everybody out there gets a, a picture of who Jesus really is, not what religion looks like, but who Jesus really is. I want everyone out there when they come into contact with me to get an idea, this is what life looks like when you surrender it to God. Not this is what life looks like when you give it to, to religion. This is what it looks like when you hand it over to God. And he's this guy and he's basically preaching at me from all this other cause. And I'm looking at him and my heart was breaking because I thought, man, why are you going out there trying to find another cause? You are part of this new creation. This new creation has a new cause. And that new cause is to go into the world and preach the gospel, make disciples who make disciples. That's the new cause. But if you're going to do that, you've got to be a person that's prepared to sacrifice. And if you're the kind of person that doesn't have sacrifice in your Christian vocabulary, then you won't do it. Now, some Sundays I throw Mars bars and Skittles at you. Some days it's just cauliflower. This is a cauliflower message. You know, cauliflower, no one likes cauliflower. I hate cauliflower. I hate even preparing cauliflower. You know, so even standing there preparing cauliflower is disgusting. That's what I feel like I'm doing now. I'm preparing cauliflower because nobody likes to hear the sacrifice word. I wonder sometimes with the Western church when I, I look around and I'm picking on the Western church because I'm in it. This is where I am right now and I take responsibility. When I say that, I'm talking about me. Have I so watered down what following Jesus is about? Have I, have I adopted all the best parts of the culture around me and said, yeah, they, they, that's what everybody loves, so Jesus will make that better? Let's just add this, add that, and anything about cost and sacrifice, we just don't want to talk about it anymore. You know, this man, this rich young ruler, fast forward to when Jesus is heading into Jerusalem. You know what Jesus was saying to this rich young ruler? Sell everything, and when I'm walking into Jerusalem, you'll be walking in with me. I'm offering you a future. I'm offering you something beyond this world. I'm offering you a part in human history. I'm offering you a role in bringing Jesus. And this is what's going on in Mark 11. They're taking Jesus into a city. And he's saying to this rich young ruler, that's the future I'm offering you. Do you want to be with me? Do you want to be a part of that people that take me to a nation, that take me to a city, that take me to a community? If you're not the kind of person that's prepared to sacrifice, then you won't be a part of that. If, it, if we can't sacrifice in prayer, how many people pray but we you know, sort of just wait till the end of the day? Oh, and if, That's if you're not too tired after work. Oh, I'll just squeeze it in later on after work. You know, if I'm not too tired and then I fall asleep. And I'm just being honest with you, I fall asleep after about, oh, Lord, you're so good. <laughs> and I wake up and I praise God for a great sleep. He's going, yeah, but I'm sitting here while you're sleeping. You're talking to me. There's a sacrifice we pay in prayer. We bring our, our community, we bring our unsaved family members, our unsaved neighbours, we, we bring uh, those people to the Lord and we, we bring them by name and we pray for them, we press in and we, we lift them up to God. There's a sacrifice in prayer if we actually want to change our nation, if we actually want to be uh, instruments of reconciliation, there's a sacrifice we pay in prayer. There's a sacrifice that we, we, we pay in energy. You know, when, when, when there's an opportunity, go and do good works. I love what, what um, Global Care do. Bevan runs our Global Care program out of Arise here, and that's the practical um, um, social justice side of, 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 of our movement. And, and when they get out there and they help people practically and do things, and, 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 and they're basically saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what people in the kingdom, this is what we do. We, we, we love others as if, like we love ourselves. You know, we help others. We, we sacrifice our own time. My world is not just about me, 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 what I want, when I want, because I want. There's something outside of that in my life. But it takes sacrifice to be able to give that. They sacrifice time, energy. Parents, you want to bring Jesus to your children. How many of you know that's a sacrifice? Because the last thing you want to do at the end of the day is sit in the end of their bed and pray with them. You've just... Runny nosed all day and yelled and screamed all day. I just want you in the room, close it, all right, walk away. Now I've got my peace. Sitting down with them and listening to their problems and being able to, to, to somehow skillfully direct them to what would, instead of taking over the situation, what do you think? Let's have a look at the Bible. What does Jesus say about it? I mean, there's a cost involved in getting Christ to your children. 
There's a cost involved. You run a business in this place. You want God to use your business. There's going to be a cost involved in you committing that business to Jesus. You're going to have to put uh, a, a kingdom values over profits. But I'm a big believer, though, if you put kingdom values first, you get profits. God takes care of all the other stuff. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. He'll take care of everything else. But there's a sacrifice involved. You want to make a difference in the world. I'm, I'm looking at causes all around the planet right now, and I see people standing up making all kinds of noise for all types of particular causes and paying all kinds of prices for all types of causes. But if I'm brutally honest, I'm just looking at a church that's sitting down quiet and silent as if we've got nothing to offer. I'm including me in that. Don't think I'm having a go at you. And if you're visiting, by the way, we don't normally do cauliflowers every week. This is just... I'm just doing cauliflowers at the moment because I feel like we're in a season and a time. And let me get a little bit prophetic with you. We're in a season and a time in the Western church. Right? Let me speak for Australia. Where our faith hasn't ever really cost us much. It just hasn't. And any of you that have lived in foreign countries and ministered in overseas, you would know exactly what I'm saying. There's a price to be paid for following Jesus. I can follow Jesus quite comfortably in this nation. There's not a lot... But in the last couple of years, we've started to see little things change. There's been little turnings of the dial in our nation where if you stand up for particular things that Jesus taught, values of the kingdom, if you, you, we're slowly but surely creating a culture where if you do want to be radical for Jesus, it's going to cost you. could cost you your job. It's going to cost you your friend network. It, it, it could cost you your reputation, which who knows what that could cost you down the track. We're getting to a place in this nation where I believe that our faith is going to start to cost us something. And if you're the kind of person that's not prepared to pay a price, if you're not prepared to sacrifice, then you'll end up just like this rich young ruler who's never heard of again and made zero difference for the kingdom of God. Now, I don't believe that any of us want to get to the end of our days. I'm going to stand before Jesus, and when I see Jesus, everything else is going to just it's just not going to mean anything. And if I have time for one final thought, and I don't know if I will, I've never been there, but I've got this feeling that when I see Jesus and I, I see in that moment how uh, amazing that he will be, and when I see the grace and the love in his eyes, if I have time for one final thought, I reckon that final thought will be, I wish I had have done more with this. I wish I had have done more with this. I wish I had have pressed into this. I wish I hadn't have been so nervous that that person might think I'm weird if I dared mention Jesus or God to them now that I'm looking at this because they're not looking at this. Wouldn't it be wonderful to get that kind of perspective now? Right now. Next week... We're going to have some changes in government restrictions in this country. On Friday, the government will make an announcement. There's no singing. I've said to you, up to this point, it's been a grey area. They haven't come out and point blanked it. Well, as of this Friday, they have all indoor gatherings. No singing, no dancing, no mingling. But you're going to hear that. Uh, it was a press conference uh, yesterday, day before. It's going to be enforced as of this coming Friday. Now, here's what I want to challenge you with, all right? And, and please don't get mad and angry at me. Please don't. And, and if you do get mad and angry at me, come and talk to me because I'm actually a really, really nice person, okay? Who thinks I'm a nice person? Okay, look around at the hands. You can see people. I'm a nice person. Come and talk to me. Don't get angry. But here's the thing. I'm already speaking to pastors who are going, we're going to shut our churches down again. We're going to close the doors again. Understand this. This here is not the pinnacle of your walk with God. I am not precious about gathering together as if this is how it has to be done. I couldn't care less about the structure you use to connect with people. Hear that very clearly. Some people love gathering like this. For some people, they just want to meet in a house church with 10 people. Some people love a mega church of a billion. I don't care what the structure is. It doesn't bother me. But, but what's important is that we don't forsake the gathering together. Of ourselves. That's what's important, right? So I'm not defending our gathering or anything like that. Hear that. But what I'm going to say is this I feel very strongly in my heart that here at a rise, I'm not speaking for anyone else, that we're not going to close our doors next weekend. Okay? We're keeping it open. 
Um, the limits remain in terms of social distancing. We'll continue to do that. But we've been given a clear directive, no singing. So we won't be singing. We've been given a clear directive, no mingling. So we're not going to be able to go next door uh, in the hall, in the hall, and have morning uh, tea and coffee, right? Now, but having said that, that also provides opportunity for us to maybe do a couple of things a little bit different. And trust me, we're going to be praying and seeking God and, and we're going to uh, make sure that this hour that we spend together is spent glorifying God, growing in our faith and so on. It's still going to happen. Here's what I want to challenge you with, all right, and please hear my heart. If having no tea and coffee and not being able to sing a couple of songs is enough to stop you from gathering, then, then what sort of discipleship are we doing in the Western Church? Where were we at if that's all it takes for God's people to say we're not going to gather together anymore? Where are we really at? I'd rather know that now. I, I'm imagining going to, to, uh, to, to India, back to India, and, and some of the places we ministered, walking into those believers and saying, yeah, your brothers and sisters in Australia, we got told we can't sing and we can't have tea and coffee, so we stopped gathering. I think they'd shake their heads in disbelief. Go, is that all it takes? Yeah, exactly like that. They'd, I cannot believe it. I think they'd be embarrassed. Go to China to the underground church. Go to Afghanistan. Go to these places where they know what it's like to sacrifice for their faith. And say to them, I'm not going to turn up on Sunday. Well, because I can't sing my three songs and I can't have a tea and coffee. So I'm not going to gather together with people. I want to challenge you with that because that's what's going to happen next week. We're not going to be able to, unless there's a radical U-turn by the government, we're not going to have those couple of elements in our gatherings. And, and I, I, I please, please hear my heart in this. I don't want this to come across like a heavy and I feel so bad because we've got people that are visiting us that haven't been here before and normally, please trust me, it's not like this. But this week, I just really feel in my heart that I need to challenge us. Uh, we don't come here. I hope you don't come here uh, on a Sunday just to be entertained. If you want entertainment, put on Seinfeld. He's amazing. He's way better than me. He's awesome, you know. If, 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 you, if we want entertainment, we can find it elsewhere. I believe when, when we gather together, we gather together to be challenged. We gather together to grow in our faith. We gather together to be poked and prodded a little bit, to think about what Leaved when you walked in the door. I'm going to poke and prod you today. You're either going to go away and go, I totally don't believe him and here's why. You work out why you don't believe it. That's fantastic. Or you're going to go away and go, you know what, I actually do believe that because I can't find any reason why it's not true. At least we're going to think about our faith, come up with our own convictions and live on the back of them. But I just want to want to say that next week we will be meeting here. And, and you know what, look, if, I've got, if we've got to sacrifice a couple of songs and sacrifice a morning tea, I, I, let, we'll do it within the confines of what the government is saying, but I'm not prepared to sacrifice the gathering together of the saints again. We have a YouTube channel that we set up 15, 16 weeks ago that we've been using, and we've continued to do that. And the reason why we've continued to do that is not to make it convenient for you when you wake up in the morning and go, I eh, just don't want to go. I'll just put my slippers on, grab a coffee. I'll watch it on YouTube anyway. That's not why we're doing it. You know why we're doing it? Because we've realised there's a whole bunch of people out there that are watching us from all different nations that we have no idea about. So we, we've decided to keep doing that because there are people who can't make it to a church service or come together and gather with people. There are people out there, even in our own nation. How many of you know that, um, I'm not going to mention names, but we've got people in this gathering here who have non-Christian partners, husbands, wives and so on. You know, there are a lot of people where their partners wouldn't even let them come. There are people literally who, because of their situations uh, uh, in our nation, who are not even allowed to attend a, 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 a gathering. And so we're putting this on because we've realised there's a real uh, need for people that can't make it. So that's why we're doing that. So I, I want to uh, just encourage you next week, please don't think, well, we're not going to have singing and tea and coffee, so I'll just stay at home. You're free to do that. You'll still go to heaven. Jesus will still love you and I'll still be your friend in that order. Okay? No dramas. It's not a religious thing. But I feel like it's a statement to the community. I feel like it's a statement to the devil, and I feel like it's a statement to God. Anyone with me? Our faith is going to end up costing us something. I'm prepared to start paying a bit of a price now. What about you? Because one day, whether you like it or not, 
will be forced to.